Well, hi everyone, it's Adrian Warnock here. It feels like a while since I've done one of these interviews, um, but you know, it's good to be here with Dan Junkins. Um, have I said that right, Dan, first of all? Yes, you did, yes. Okay. Well, it's lovely to meet you, Dan, and um, Dan's a new friend of mine. Um, he's joined us on uh, one or two of the Blood Cancer Uncensored weekly Zoom calls that we do, which is one of the you know best kept secrets of the internet, I sometimes feel. Except we don't keep it a secret. We do talk about it on the various uh, Facebook forums and WhatsApp groups and all the rest of it that we're on. Um, but not everyone joins. And I guess, you know, some people probably don't feel the need to have support and help as they go through this blood cancer journey. But I know I did. And, um, I think you did as well too, Dan. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it was, um, I would say it was one of the key ingredients for my own uh, mental sustenance and emotional sustenance was really having, and really the key piece of all that was my wife reaching out to all the friends and family people that we knew and all the communities we lived through in all of our lives. She ended up compiling a list of like 987 people or something like that. So it was really quite wonderful and overwhelming, but it, I loved it. I mean, I'm a Leo. I was, that I was, life that was supporting you. That's wonderful. Yeah, it was, you know, I'm a Leo. I, I was born in the month of August and, you know, they say Leo's like attention and I certainly didn't have a problem with all of the attention. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so Dan, um, you know, you were diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia. How long ago was that now? So that was April of 2017. I was diagnosed. So, you know, what a lot of people probably don't realize is getting to you know, one year is, is um, four years. Where are we now? Five, so quite a few years, hey, since, since that. It, 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 every year must feel great, and, but especially the first one, isn't it? Because with these acute uh, leukemias, it is that first year that, that can actually be a, a touch and go, matter of life and death, which some of us with more chronic ones don't necessarily quite see it that way. There's no watch and wait with AML, is there, for example? Right. Um, and I will really be honest that, you know, when you're diagnosed with something acute, you're, you're kind of, you're blind to like all the other varieties and flavors of leukemia. So, uh, you know, I had no idea of the chronic versions um, until later, a few years down the road, but I've, uh, so I noticed that the problems or the concerns or the issues associated with acute versions versus chronic versions, there's, there's different, um, there are different ways and beings that people have uh, in how they relate to things. So it took, after my chemo, it took me about a year before my blood levels returned to normal level. Um, I was lucky enough that I didn't have to go through any other kind of stem cell work or, um, radiation work or anything like that. So I was lucky in that sense um, that I just had to go through the, the, the chemotherapy uh, process. Yeah. But huge shock, you know, I mean, I think I remember you saying you weren't particularly unwell and you had a blood test in you and it's like, get to the hospital now kind of thing. Is that, is that roughly yeah. what happened? Yeah. I literally went through a week what I, of what I thought was just a normal, well, flu. I had high temperature fever of like 104 for a week. I was not eating. Um, I couldn't keep anything down. I lost like 20 pounds in a week, uh, but thought, well, this was just a bad flu. And in fact, during that week, I'd read the Boston Globe, the main newspaper of the city saying that there was an, another epidemic of the flu going around the city. And I thought, well, that's what I have. Um, and I tried to go to work after the eight days of going through this flu and finally the fever broke. And I noticed something was weird in it. When I started walking, my legs felt like rubber and I had not experienced that before. It, it was like, I almost couldn't keep myself up, which for me being a runner and a long distance runner and an athlete, that was, that was concerning, but I tried to push it to the back of my head, just thinking, oh, it's just a bad case of the flu. Um, but I got to work and I turned right around and went home and went to sleep. And that was when my wife said, you've got to go to the doctor. So I went the next day. He didn't even, 
Thank you, Gianna, my wife. <laughs> and um, the doctor looked at me. He didn't even sit, sit me down or anything. He's like, you know what? I'm taking a blood test right now. You are white as a ghost. So uh, he literally took a blood test sample and he says, why don't you go home and we'll figure out what, what's happening. So I went home and I don't know what it is. It's that phenomenon of going to a doctor. I felt better. Uh, I went home, I fell asleep. I woke up the next morning and I was just like, oh, this is great. I'll, uh, I can go to work. I feel great. And that's when the call came in and the call came in from the lab the blood lab itself and the head lab technician just said, are you Dan Junkins? You got to get to the emergency room now. And it was like, wow. So we got there and that was when the first word came out of the nurses. It was, it was a room that they brought me into with nurses and doctors. And the head nurse said, we think you might have leukemia. It's like getting hit with a sledgehammer. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah, I don't know that word hitting me. Um, I mean, for me, of course, it came with, it's probably chronic, don't worry about it, but come and see me quickly. So it was a really weird mixed message for me. It wasn't as clear cut as you. I, I was already in hospital, mind you, because I had pneumonia as well. So I was hit with two. <sighs> I had a pneumonia, which was no doubt because of the immune compromise that I had because of my uh, leukemia. But for me, um, I had this weird phone call because they looked at the bloods from my um, A&E visit. And uh, the hematologist rang me up, didn't realise I was already in hospital and said, hey, you need to come back quickly, but not to A&E, to outpatients. So it's a measure of the different level of urgency, if you like. Um, but then she, said, so she did say she wanted to see me quickly. Um, and she did use the word leukaemia. But then she said, don't worry, you, you've, you've had it for a long time. It's a chronic one. And, but I didn't really hear that. I didn't really hear that. I just heard leukaemia, cancer, you know. Um, so... But, but I guess the difference for you as well, it was action stations. Whereas with me, it was like, we're not going to do anything for a while, which is a bit of a, a different sort of story as well. And there's a whole reason for that with the chronic ones. But for you, it was like, everything had to go on hold, huh? And you were like, admitted to hospital and bang, we need to save yeah. your life. <laughs> I mean, it was, I mean, the previous hour, I was petting my cats, sitting on the couch, ready to go out the door. And the next thing I know, I'm like, in a host in the emergency room, in a bed with, multiple doctors throughout the day just coming in talking to me taking multiple blood samples and finally they took a um, bone marrow biopsy um that was when my wife exited out she wasn't going to stick around for that um a little background about my wife the, one of the reasons why she exited was that she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis uh relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis back in 2000 I met her in 2005, um, but by then she had already started, um, she had just gone through this, uh, she'd been on drugs, massive drugs, administered, self-administered uh, shots that she was doing daily. And two months before I met her, she, had, uh, she was supposed to lead a seminar and uh, she woke up that morning and she had an attack. And she hadn't had an attack for a while, but the attacks usually involved vertigo, dizziness, um, the dragging of a foot, um, numbness in her extremities. And so she, um, she was really concerned. She was supposed to lead a seminar that night and she called up a friend of hers and she said, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Um, the reason why she was concerned is that these attacks would last for weeks and months at a time usually bedridden or she'd have to put eye patches over one eye um, or just try and sleep it off. Um, and she said, I don't know what to do. Her friend was a former Navy SEAL, a rather rough, gruff, tough fellow. Um, and he said, in not so nice terms, but sometimes these statements can trigger intriguing uh, reactions from, from us at times. And he basically, the words were, have you ever considered that when these attacks happen, you're always the one that's around? And she's like, yeah, I'm a victim. This stuff just happens. And he said, well, why don't you consider that you might have the capacity to control this? He said, just think about it. I'm not saying I have the answers here. You might just consider that you have some control. 
And she, and of course I'm editing it down a little bit, but she said, okay, I'll think about it. She literally just crawled back into bed and went to sleep. And she woke up four hours later and the symptoms were gone. And she was in shock she, that had never happened before. And she had never had a conversation quite like that before. What happened was is that it triggered a conversation for her many years ago of a friend of hers who told her to consider the Herb Benson's Mind Body program at, at the Mass General Hospital. And it's all about the mind body connection, the parasympathetic nervous system, being able to access that through meditation and visualization. And so um, she just thought I should delve into this some more. And she enrolled herself and within about six months, she, she took on um, all these practices that she learned through these classes that she took there. And she reduced her lesions and her symptoms by like, where was it 10 at the worst end of the scale to down to like a two. Wow. And, and they did an MRI and she actually had reduced the lesions. So, and am I saying that this is the panacea for everything? No, yeah. I'm not I, saying that. You know? When you got told you had acute leukemia, I mean, you didn't, you, I mean, you may have used it down the line, but you, you took medicine, didn't you? You took Western chemo, yeah? I did. Oh yeah, I did. And I, you know, I don't know if I alluded to this too much in the book, but both my wife and I had this sort of prejudice towards Western medicine for a while. We did. We really did. We were like, you know, she had been successful with this and then I was diagnosed. Um, and we made the decision reluctantly to just go ahead and do it, to do the chemo. Yeah. Um, that's good because I guess you would have died if you hadn't, presumably. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I've learned and really it mellowed me and it really had me kind of wake up to this idea of getting myself out of being entrenched in certain positions or being righteous about this is the way it should be. Um, and I think this has been a wonderful gift for me is going through this process of being diagnosed with leukemia, taking on Western medicine and discovering that it was really the only option I had. Um, but that, right. but that at that point, at that point. Yeah. Yeah, and it doesn't exclude alternative practices. What's interesting is the hospital where I went through the chemo offered um, Reiki services uh, for people that had cancer. And I took advantage of it every, every other week. Um, and it was phenomenal. And I had actually tried Reiki years, years, and years ago prior to that. And I didn't think much of it. I was just like, I don't feel anything. And when I was going through the chemo, it was wonderful. I mean, I, I, I can't distinguish or know or understand what the phenomenon is, but it worked. If I felt it worked, like my brain and my mind and my brain just really, um, attract was attracted to it. So, it, you know, it, all of a sudden it was like Western medicine, alternative medicine, everything works. It, you know, we have to carve our own path, so to be, so oh, to speak. Oh, I think that's the problem. People think it's either or, you know, and it's like that. And there are people, unfortunately, who, who in your position would have rejected the chemo and so I'll do the Reiki, I'll take some supplements maybe, or I'll change my diet, I'll go and visit someone else for candida treatment or whatever else, and, and then sadly would die, you know. Um, but actually, you know, you did the smart thing, you took the, the medicine, but you didn't exclude other things because, you know, um, we are whole beings. And, and our brain definitely is affected by our mind and our body is affected by our mind. I mean, it's one of the things that um, fascinates me, actually, from my background as, as a medical researcher, is the concept of placebo. I, I don't know how much you've looked into this in some of the clinical trials, um, but we compare drugs to placebo. And uh, placebo is usually a sugar pill, or sometimes it's an injection if the drug's an injection. And the idea is the patient doesn't know what they're getting. So the patient is told what to expect. They're told, look, you know, you, you're either going to get the drug or the placebo. They're given a list of side effects that they can expect from the drug and they're told how they how we hope the drug is going to help them um and we and we explain that you know we're giving you a placebo to see whether the drug works or not often it will be in addition to normal treatment as well you know you might you might 
give somebody placebo plus regular treatment and then the other person regular treatment plus your new drug yeah so but here's the really interesting thing which i always thought blew my brain when i first learned about this back as a medical student is that placebo actually often works it doesn't work for everyone but yeah. it works for some people um but it can also give you side effects that's the really weird thing it can give you the same side effects as the drug that you've just been told about because you've obviously been listed you know they'll say you may get a headache you may get this you may get that and so lo and behold placebo in that trial will have side effects that mirror the drug because people are expecting it um which is really fascinating to me um and something that we maybe should play with a little bit more in, in medicine and, and in our own situation how how we affect our body by what our brain is expecting a little bit like what you're saying having some sense of control so be interested a little bit more in your thoughts about that because I know that's a big part of the book and the book is something to do with peacocks and poison I remember you're going to have to remind me <laughs> the exact yeah that's thank you for that um I will say that um you know I, I went through about a day and a half of shock um after my diagnosis but I will say that having my wife next to me and, and knowing her experience and knowing what she had done and that for 10 years she was, she's been in, actually 13 years, she's been in benign status. In 2017, she had been in benign status for like nine years uh, with no symptoms. And it just was a reassuring factor for me, knowing that she has been in benign status with a chronic condition. Of course, that doesn't always say that we say the word healed, and I'm perfectly comfortable in saying that word, uh, but I understand that that can reactivate some people um, in the medical community, but some, some, a lot of people in the medical community are, grant people the freedom to say that too. But for me, I noticed that the night before my chemo was, was uh, prescribed to me and, and they came in and told me the, the whole induction uh, process and then the consolidation process. Um, my mom was there, my, my wife was there. I had two of my best friends, my brother was there. After everybody left, I kind of went into this quiet space and just sort of really relaxed. I kind of started to go into sort of like a meditative space for myself and just quieted down because it had been rush, rush, rush. Doctors, nurses, people visiting for the first two days, it was just crazy. And I finally just started to breathe quietly. And, and this thought went through my head. It was like a mantra. Um, and the mantra was dive into uncertainty with courage and surround myself with love. I mean, like, say that again more slowly. Dive into uncertainty with courage and surround everyone with love. Wonderful. I don't know why it happened. I can't explain it. It just was there. It's been kind of my theme and my resonating pillar, so to speak, in my life since then. Um, and what that did was it kind of motivated me. For a minute before, because I like that. Dive into uncertainty with courage. And I think uncertainty is a crucial thing when you're facing a cancer diagnosis, whether it's acute or chronic. Yeah. Uh, a way, you know, with the acute, you're faced with the certainty of death unless something happens. And the only uncertainty is whether the drug will work. With the chronic, one of the reasons actually psychologically it can be quite difficult to deal with a chronic is you have uncertainty you don't know whether you're going to have very mild disease that will never need treated for the next 20 years or whether you're going to die in a year and a half or two years of something you know and or how aggressive it's going to be when you're diagnosed and that that process can be quite difficult the uncertainty i think and obviously you had uncertainty because you didn't know whether your drug was going to work so that was that was the uncertainty for you but there's also you know the uncertainty of the disease so what do you think it means to dive into uncertainty with courage? I think it means that we have to recognize the fact that there's nothing predictable in life. I think that we, we our minds are, we gravitate towards comfort and security. Um, our bodies are actually designed to move and to have some kind of discomfort. And I think there's a constant battle between the mind wanting that security and comfort and our bodies that want to move and risk ourselves and get out there and, and do things. And um, I think that that sort of dynamic that goes on with us as human beings and the fact that 
we really don't have control over any circumstance when we walk out the door in the morning that, you know, at any moment we can get hit by a car. Um, you know, I can be eating all the herbs and all the alternative stuff and say I'm healed, but, you know, you can go out the door and get whacked by something and you're gone, you know? I mean, so I, <clears throat> I had to grant that notion or, or recognition that that, that was true. And so it musters up some level of like, can I risk that? Might as well. I mean, my God, I'm in a hospital. I've been diagnosed with this leukemia. I mean, <laughs> just go for it. So I just felt like what I needed to do was free myself up and trust the doctors and trust this process and just allow for whatever results would show up to show up and make it easy on everybody, you know, sending out love for everyone. I mean, you know, it, for me, I, it was a, a context um, that really was, I think, a decisive moment for me um, in having that occur and, and a gift, so to speak. I, I relate to it that way. Um, it also kind of pricked my own creative process and my own background um, in the fact that my dad was a writer and a poet, my mother was an artist. So we were surrounded by the arts and stories and storytelling. Um, and I've always been attracted to reading. And I read this, it, my memory came in pl to play here is that I remembered a story about uh, peacocks. And I couldn't quite remember everything. It took me, but I was like committed that I wanted to remember this story. And I finally found it on the internet after a few hours. And I discovered that the story was a story describing the different spiritual paths in the Hindu religion. And they use the metaphor of discovering a poisonous plant along a path. And that one way people can deal with that is to just remove the plant and go on in life, just like you remove the problem and go on in life. Um, another way is to get to the root and dig up the plant along with the root so it doesn't come back, just like you get to a root of a problem. Um, the third way are the way of the doctors where they can transform the poison into medicine. But the one that resonated deeply for me, especially with the protocol that I was given was the way of the peacock. And I didn't know anything about the peacock, but they say that peacocks kill poisonous snakes and they eat poisonous plants for sustenance. And so I was inspired by that. And so I, I just latched on to that. And I went, I'll be a peacock when I go through this chemo. So <laughs> I took it on. It became sort of my, uh, I don't know, uh, spiritual guide, so to speak. Um, and it really seemed to resonate. And uh, I, I took it on and I, I shared about it all the time. I had friends writing cards with peacocks on them. I was plastering them all over my hospital room, talked to the nurses about it to no end. Um, so it was, that was sort of the, the impetus for the peacock theme, so to speak, for me. Really interesting. So it kind of comes out of sort of mythology. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Of mythology. Uh, I mean, are you, are you a Buddhist or Hindu, whatever it was, or? Well, no, I'm, I'm, I would call myself a, um, a Gnostic, not agnostic, but a Gnostic. I, I find um, the mystics uh, are fascinating. The, the mystics in the Christian religion, the mystics in the Jewish religion, the Kabbalah, and the, uh, the Sufis in the Muslim religion. I love the, the poetry and the words that they've written and spoken. It's, I've always resonated with it. And it became very profound for me during my chemo um, to read those types of texts and, and um, just gain sustenance from that. Hmm. Yeah. Can you give me an example of something that you can remember that helped you? Yeah, um, St. John of the Cross, a wonderful figure in the Christian religion, was a mystic. Um, and he was, he was jailed by the Inquisition uh, for, for preaching blasphemy. Uh, and he was put in a cell um, where he could barely move. Um, and a jailer 
had some compassion for him and slipped him some paper and uh, pen, and he wrote this incredible poem. Um, I can recite a, a, a snippet of it, a small snippet of it, um, which was, and he did this while he's in jail, in this isolation jail. And the words go, um, a generous heart will never care to go part way. It won't be cowed if there's passage somewhere. And with faith soaring like a cloud, it feeds on something I don't know that one may come on randomly. Wow. Hmm. Yeah. So. How did, what did that mean for you at the time? Um, well, I think the one that came on randomly were the words that came into my head the night before the chemo. Um, and that one, maybe the oneness of the universe and humanity that um, those words came in into my being. Um, so for me, it was, it was a deeply personal sort of moment or recognition when I read those words, like, hmm. And um, so I was, I was really moved by that idea or notion um, that there's a certain universality about all of us at a certain level. And that if we keep recognizing that, that there's, um, I don't know, I think that there's some mysterious patterns and beautiful um, processes that start to occur if we can humble ourselves a little bit. Uh, yeah. And I, I like your focus on others. I think that's quite interesting. because Obviously, there's an inner journey, if you like, um, that, that happens when you're facing, you know, real challenges where you, you look at your own reaction and clearly you know that's i suppose part of your first thing about the uncertainty and mm -hmm. but your focus on wanting to love others wanting to help others and, and now wanting to help others through your story and through what you you know your book and everything i mean talk to me a bit about that because surely at the time of greatest peril is the time when you might be forgiven for being selfish you know that's so interesting that you use the word selfish because that sort of uh, was something that had me um, hold back from writing. Um, for years, actually, I'd wanted to be a writer for a long, long, long time, but I held back one because I thought it was a really selfish endeavor, but I think I was using that as a cover and that what was really running the show was my own insecurities and the fact my father was well published and my mother was this pretty well known artist and so I I sort of held back like I could never be like them and uh I but I was really pushed by a lot of friends and a lot of family members um pushing me that I need to write about this because other people need to know this and to gain some kind of inspiration and hope for themselves and so I think that that more than anything was um, the idea of writing really was pushed by a lot of friends and family people. Um, so I thought, okay, it's time to start putting the, my nose to the grindstone, so to speak, and, and start doing something that can make a difference for others. And also creating a new path for my life beyond what I had been doing before I was diagnosed. Okay. But you know, in a sense, though, isn't that just an outworking of your desire to, to love others? Because, you know, if you feel you've got something you want to share, uh, yeah. you know, isn't it? Isn't that part of the picture? So you, in a sense, you, you kind of made a decision to be others focused right on that. Hospital. Yes. Yeah. And it actually makes it a lot easier for me to to write more and to and to um, give away the writing and, and let people see if it's something that resonates with them so I, in a lot of ways it's been um a real i would say that I, I don't even call it work now i mean i just feel like i'm doing what i what i'm supposed to be doing and and it's um that keeps me going um and i i just really appreciate the i i have to tell you like just in the last week i'm getting people who are writing me by email saying that they're buying more copies for their cousins and aunts because they, they think that it, it's really going to help them. And I'm like, 
wow, I've never had this experience before. So I'm just like, you know, um, that's moving. And, and it's not about me. It's really about the words. It's hope. Isn't that what people are looking for? Mm -hmm. I think that is, isn't it? Fundamentally what people are looking for. And that's what you're kind of offering in, in, in what you, how you found hope. And I mean, I know for me, I, the second book I wrote was on hope. Uh, very different. Was. It was called Hope Reborn. Um, and, and my book was obviously about some of those sort of fundamental issues of, of life that you sort of touched on a little bit in terms of faith and, you know, possibly an afterlife and all those kind of thoughts, religious thoughts, if you like. And that's obviously one area where people find hope, but it's not the only area. And even people who have a Christian faith need other areas um, to, to get hope from as well. But yeah, that's why I went for hope as the title. And it's really interesting because for me, when I got sick, it was like, well, do you really have hope, Adrian? <laughs> you know, and, and it really challenged me, um, as I'm sure you went through that challenge as well, of feeling a bit hopeless at times, no doubt. Were you like that? Or did you just sail through? Um, I hate to say these words because it's going to sound like I'm some sort of goody two-shoe or something, but um, I, I really did not struggle, uh, oh. at least mentally. Mentally, I didn't struggle because I think that what was there for me that night before I had the chemo was, okay, I'm letting go. I'm not going to worry about work. I'm not going to worry about money. I'm not going to worry about a damn thing. I'm going to kick back and just relax because the nurses kept saying it to me, you just need to take care of yourself. We'll take care of everything else. You just relax. Um, and what was intriguing about that was that literally on the first day when I got the chemo, um, there was a lady from the financial office within the hospital who came in and sat down. And I think I wrote about this in the book where she said, you don't have to worry about money right now because you're now, I didn't actually have insurance when I went into the hospital, but she came in and she said, you've got insurance now because you're disabled. And so because you're disabled, the state of Massachusetts is now gonna take care of everything that you're gonna get from the hospital. So that was mind blowing. I, I hadn't even considered that as an option or thought anything. Cause all I'm thinking about is like IVs, nurses, doctors, all that stuff. So. The idea or notion that I didn't have to worry about that was huge. And it was so interesting that the night before was when I went into this space of like, let it go, trust, just trust the universe. It's going to work out. Um, and so it was like a ongoing process of things just starting to take care of themselves and less was needed for me to worry about anything. Um, and so I, <coughs> It was amazing. So Jana, wow. my wife, my Jana, my wife was just like rallying groups of people to come and clean our house so that it was, you know, spot clean before I came home. Um, people donating, I mean, donating money because we were basically my income was gone. So it was, I, I was stunned um, how easy it was. So I was like kicking back, watching a lot of TV, reading a lot of books. Um, and just really relaxing. Now, that doesn't mean that I didn't have some hiccups along the way. I mean, I did go through a number of fevers, quite a few number, low grade fevers, but every time that I would have those moments of being away from the hospital between the chemotherapy, I would pop a fever and then I was back in the hospital again. Um, you know, because that, I was under orders from the doctors the moment I noticed any kind of fever coming on, I had to call them and go back into the hospital. So that was a bit frustrating, but the fact that I had Jana right by my side uh, was just huge for me. Um, and a lot of close friends that showed up too. I'm glad you had that experience. Sometimes when people get to the end of their treatment, that can be a bit of a shock. Um, and that can sometimes be when it hits, especially, I think, for people who didn't really have time to process it before chemo or whatever, because obviously, you know, you didn't have, you had no time to really think about it. You're like, get on with it. We're, we're action stations. Did, did that affect you at all? Did that, did that hit you afterwards? 
this is gonna this I had the opposite um reaction. It was interesting because I was so committed to having others contributing to others while I was in the hospital that I engaged in a lot of conversations and got to be close friends with a number of nurses um and doctors because I was just the chatty catty. I mean, I couldn't stop talking to anybody. Um so when it came near the end, um I actually started. Uh, noticing I was, I felt like I had this family that I created at the hospital and I was enjoying myself so much that I actually missed it. Um, and I had this sort of sense of loss, so to speak, by leaving the hospital. That's going to sound bizarre for some people, but it, it just, I mean, you're getting served hand and foot like 24 hours, seven days a week. I mean, it's nonstop. They're, they're, they're at your beck and call all the time. Um, and there was something quite, I don't know, endearing about that for me. Uh, I, I was just, you kind of get blown away at the, at the amount of um, attention you get when you're in the hospital. Um, and so, and I didn't know it until afterwards, uh, after I'd left the hospital, but I found out from one of the nurses that the nurses were battling to have me on their routes within the, <laughs> within the ward because I guess everybody enjoyed talking to me. So I, I was I was a I was a, an attractive commodity for some, for some of the nurses because I talked all the time and I was I guess I noticed a phenomenon which is that I was a younger patient from most AML patients. Um, they they kept on saying that I was a young, because I was 50, let's see, I was 55 at the time. And they say it was usually people in their late 60s to 70s that get AML or younger children. So they kept saying I was sort of in between, but they considered me a younger patient, uh, which I really loved hearing that word that I was younger, but. <laughs> yeah, I bet, I bet you did. So how about the re-entry then? Because, I mean, you talk about that sense of loss coming out of the hospital. Um, I'm guessing you felt pretty wiped out by the chemo. You, you mentioned it took a year for your bloods to get back. To the hospital. Um, that process, because um, I guess then it is chronic, isn't it? Suddenly you're week in, week out, um, maybe not feeling quite as strong as you were, and how to rebuild and recover, I suppose. So what was that like for you? Um, well, you know, a lot of it was... Um, intriguing part was that I was getting a lot of visitors coming to the house seeing me um, I was feeling um, that I had to start writing and so I started writing more um, and I was an athlete um, and I couldn't run uh, but I really dove into this phenomenon of doing a lot of walking. Uh -huh. um, and that had always been something that I found tough or infuriating as a, as a long distance runner, I, walking, I always felt it was boring. I liked having the movement and the motion to go long distances. And so um, for me, there was this new phenomenon, a new appreciation for just walking and just really taking in things and slowing down. So my life just, I really um, decided to have my life just become a lot slower. Uh -huh. uh, Is that something, then, or did you gradually speed up again? Say that again, I didn't hear that. Have you been slow since then, or have you sped up a bit? I've kept it slow. <laughs> I mean, oh. you're kind of breaking up there, I'm sorry. Oh, back to the running at all or not? I have, I've done a lot, I've, you know, I've gained, gone back to running, but uh, Jen and I still incorporate a lot of walking too. So um, it's been, um, it's been great in one sense because um, I'm running not to try and get faster. I'm just running to sort of take in everything. So I don't run as fast, but I run just as long, but a lot slower and it's, it's fine. I'm, I don't have an agenda to sort of, pushback being a competitive long distance runner I always was 
would go out and run and somebody else was running, I had to get ahead of them. And then I had to get ahead of them. So this is this has given me this new appreciation for I can still be in good shape and still be active, but um, taking in the daily um, occurrences within the city of Austin um, has become a new uh, sort of delicious experience for me. Bring life, I guess. It's probably one of the sounds like you've learned from all of this, huh? Yeah. Sounds good. And just, um, have you got a copy of your book there? You can wave at us or not? You see, I you're not. I, you're not I, I have it here I, to wave. Right. What I can do, I can see the screen of the copy. Oh, very good. I don't How's know. that? Yeah, if, let me just... work on that. But um, just um, remind us of the title of it. How about that? Sure. So it's Peacock's Poison and Leukemia, A Life of Vibrant Health. And the digital version is available on Amazon right now. Um, and that's available in the UK as well as in the US and probably most other countries too on the different Amazon websites. So you don't have to go to the US to buy it. That's true. And you don't have to have a Kindle uh, either. You don't need a, any special accessory. You can just literally click on Kindle and they allow you to have a Kindle cloud reader that allows you to, for no charge either. So you can read it on your PC, your laptop, or your cell phone. Paper version. Is there a paper version available as well or not? There will, be a, there will be a paper, paper version coming out in about a week to a week and a half. Yeah. Time it's available digitally for, I think it's a dollar, and it's actually less than a pound. It's about 80p for those who are watching in the UK. Um, yes. Yeah, we're, we're, our, our pound is worth a little bit more than yours at the moment. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Um, but yeah, so that's all good. Um, I would encourage people to have a look at that. Um, but Don, you've also agreed, haven't you, to, to be an author here and, and that, um, on Blood Cancer Uncensored. So talk to us a little bit about what you hope to achieve from your writing. I don't know. <laughs> I just figure I got to write. I just have to write um, my what what's occurring for me and what 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 inspires people. Um, and my main interest is really what what would inspire people to, to find their own healing pathways? Because I think that we're healing beings, that we're always healing in some way, shape, or form. My, my metaphor is like when, the, when we cut a finger or cut ourselves, the, the body is already starting to heal and do things to regenerate. So I think there's the recognition of our body and mind's capacity for health and healing that our bodies are designed that way. We want to be in a healthy state that the mind wants that too. So my interest is in writing in ways that allow for people to sort of carve their own path to discover their own inner healing core, I like to call it. Um, and whatever path that is, that's yours. That's not mine. It's not yours. It's, it's, it's that person. So um, it kind of resonates with me. It's, it's sort of the, the mystic path, I would say, you know, it's, it's a deeply personal thing and that we have to give ourselves the space. I always say that the first thing is find a quiet space, slow down and you'll find it. Very good. And I think, I think it's interesting, isn't it? There is this journey that people need to go on and yeah, for some people that'll be a journey of faith and sort of religious belief. And for other people that'll be a journey, um, you know, that's more, mystical or for other people it may not involve faith at all um but it is a healing journey that we need to go on you're right and obviously for somebody like me you know i would have a set of beliefs and someone else have a different set of beliefs and we need to respect each other and sometimes listen as well because you know we can sometimes learn something so someone watching this right now you know they might be like oh you know this guy what's he talking about peacocks and hindus be ashamed to then throw out you know, the baby with the bathwater, if you like, it doesn't matter if you don't necessarily agree with some of the philosophical bits any more than it matters if you believe um, my, my faith in terms of what you can get from it. Of course, it matters in one sense, because, you know, what's true and, and, and in the ultimate sense does matter. But in terms of what works pragmatically day to day, there are bits we can learn from each other. You know, I mean, the, the Buddhists, for example, talk a lot about mindfulness and meditation. Some of the things you've talked about come straight from that, but you don't have to be a Buddhist to to practice that you know those things i mean meditation is part of the bible it's very clear in the bible it's part of another 
privileged space too but it's it's like let's see what we can get from different places a little bit without necessarily taking on board everything or the philosophy and so for us here at blood cancer uncensored you know it's a delight to welcome you as a new author with maybe a slightly different perspective to some of us um and some slightly different things you'll be talking about but you know you'll find that there's other authors that will talk about um some of these philosophical things some of these psychological things this idea of slowing down um i've, I've certainly written about slowing down uh, mm. this idea about hope um wherever you find that hope um and this idea of looking out for others i mean in a sense that's what this is how websites about it's like i have to stop thinking it's like we're, we're a group of beggars you know we've all been through this journey together you know we've we've had our confidence stripped away from us we've been starving at that moment of desperation and, and maybe we found some bread somewhere and it's like why would we keep a hold of that for ourselves why would we not sort of say hey look this is what i found that you may not find it helpful you might not like this but i found it helpful and maybe this will help you or maybe if, if my thing won't help you maybe just me sharing what has helped me will help you find what helps you i, I guess is that a fair sort of summary of where, where you're at because i think that's yeah I'm... absolutely i mean my my own spiritual sort of journey um in, is inclusive it's not exclusive my my interest is in including um all christian faiths i will admit that my mother was a catholic my father was a, was a methodist they compromised they brought us they brought us up episcopalian um okay. then i we gravitated towards uh, a unitarian congregational church uh later on and then i remember one of the deepest most spiritual experiences i ever had was visiting my dad on a caribbean island and going to a baptist service on a caribbean island and had this amazing experience of being invited by the natives to this incredible baptist service where they sang the entire time i mean i was just blown away i mean my feeling is, is i i now have this deep appreciation for all faiths and all belief systems and i find it fascinating it's not about excluding anything. It's about really inviting and being open to hearing what people have to say. Because I feel like I learn something new every week. I've learned something new being a part of this group every week. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh... Your perspective on our Zoom calls. Because it's funny, often people, I mean, a lot of people are probably looking at this on the internet. But that's the largest number of people will see this video on the website. And then the next group on Facebook, perhaps on the page, um, and then there's a smaller group, about 800 people who, who join us in the Facebook group for discussion, mm. and you'd be part of that. And then there's an even smaller kind of cohort, which you've quickly found your way into, which I'm thrilled about, which is our weekly Zoom call. It tends to be, you know, between 10 and 25 people most weeks. It's, it's, and it's not always the same people, although there's a core that come. And for many of us, well, I'd be interested in your perspective of what it felt like to join that. My perspective was... Um... I didn't know what I was going to fall into when I first sort of extended the request to be a part of the group. I, I saw that there was, at least on the Facebook page is where I first saw uh, the group. And um, it was intriguing to me. Um, and I was intrigued by the fact that there were people from across the pond and, uh, and people here in the United States and that that was one attraction. Um, but the other part was noticing that it just seemed that there was a wide breadth of um, differing things that were going on. And I, I found that reassuring. Um, and I love that. Um, it's eclectic in some ways, but I think that it, it's not restrictive in any way. And I, and I really enjoyed that part right away. And I really felt like I was welcomed with open arms. So it was really, really wonderful. Yeah, it's a little bit like a family, isn't it? That court. Yes. Um, yes. That, that's, you know, we sometimes joke about it and call it our blood family, but it's not really a joke. It's kind of <laughs> a family in a way. We've all experienced the thing of knowing your blood is turned against you, you know, and needs to be dealt with. <laughs> so, um, and it, it does yeah. give us camaraderie. And, and as you say, there is a wide variety of, different things that go on in the group and on the website as well so it'd be wonderful to have yet another perspective to that and you know we look forward to to what you're going to write and, and discovering with you uh, what you're going to write you know maybe your second book will be born on on the pages of blood cancer uncensored perhaps i don't know we'll see and i'll be looking forward to hearing and reading your writings as well i mean i, I you know i 
I've already been intrigued by some of the interviews that you've done on here, and I've been intrigued by some of the writings I've writ read. And I really, um, I look forward to continuing and partnering and finding out where my writing and my words take me and hopefully take others. You know? yeah. I mean, we obviously right now there's an awful lot about COVID on there. Uh, there's also a lot about medical treatment on there. There's a lot about the science on there, but there's also quite a lot about the psychological journey and the philosophy and how to care for your own sort of soul and the soul of other people when they're going through those things as well. And the struggles that some people have, perhaps particularly when they're not fortunate enough to fight to fall into that sort of environment of lots of people supporting them and and they feel alone or they feel abandoned and all of that sort of thing. And and um, so. Yeah, it's going to be great to sort of um, hear what you've got to say and, and for us all to sort of bounce off each other a bit, really. Um, there's no, you know, right answer about how to deal with some of these things. You know, no, there's no manual, is there, you know, that tells you what to do when someone tells you you've got blood cancer. Um, there's no right or wrong answer in one sense. You know, in a lot of ways, that for me uh, is kind of exciting and inspiring that there is no manual. There is no manual for life. Um, yeah. You know, we pick and choose the manuals that we choose to follow or make our own. Um, and I'm fine with any of it, but I will say that I don't want to step over. Um, you know, we've been talking about my book and my own, me and, and your own processes and stuff, but I don't want to step over the loss of a, of a close friend within the community here. And I want to just acknowledge the, the people that have shared about the loss. And um, I really felt the family um, showing up in this group this past few days. And um, I didn't want to step up to that. Uh, to be honest, because you know, Tom was pretty much a founder member of this group. He, he started with us on the Zoom calls really early on and uh, very much someone who was focused on other people and, and using his expertise to help others and in a very compassionate and friendly way as well. So, um, but you know, life goes on and um, the group goes on and the, I guess the pain that we feel when we lose somebody is, is the price we pay for, for community and for love. I mean, we could just hide ourselves away and be lonely all our lives, but then I guess your pain goes on in a different way, doesn't it? And so, you know, we, we obviously welcome new people in and um, fortunately it's not something that happens often. We haven't lost too many yet, but um, I guess it's inevitable in life. You know, life does come to an end, doesn't it? Uh, I mean, that goes back to one of the things you said earlier. We will yes. all... I mean, my interest in um, touching on Tom and his passing is that my there is a chapter in my book about being a hospice volunteer and how that really gave me an immense amount of um, reassurance, I guess, going through my own chemo um, and the recognition that, you know, 99% of life is about showing up and being there for others and being there for yourself um, and knowing that we're all looking to connect um, and that my book is really about a quality of life, not a quantity of life. We all want that quantity, but I think quality is, is, is damn important. And so um, I just that's, really- That's great. And that, that's a good, you know, that's a real big issue for a lot of people at the moment with COVID because all of us have had our lives, you know, curtailed to some degree or other over the last two years, um, whether that's voluntarily or, pay, you know, what the government's told us. And of course, for many of us now who, who are worried about our immune systems, it can still be quite worrisome and, and difficult um, to know how to balance that, you know, that sense of risk, that sense of fear, that sense of, can I really do that? versus that sense of where, hey, I need to be connected with people. I need to find ways of being with other people. And of course we can do that online, so that's a pretty safe way, but we do need those those face-to-face -face moments as well, don't we? So it's a, it's not an easy journey for some people, I think, at the moment. I, and I, I, I wanna make sure that when I said what I said, it, I'm not saying that it's easy. Um, I think that it's it's simple, it can be very simple, but I think there's a distinction between things being simple and being easy because the simplest things sometimes are the hardest things. Um, and I think that the simplicity of just connecting in whatever way, shape or form it takes, um, we should just keep doing that. And, and I think that that's the most vital and important thing that we could all take on 
Um, and if there's some way that we can cross this divide or bridge of all of the COVID stuff um, and that there's certain people on one side of the coin and some on the other, uh, you know, if we could just grant the recognition that we're all here trying to do the best we can, I think that we could move forward in some way. Um, and that, you know, Western medicine has a place in our lives um, and as well as alternative practices, you know, it can include everything. No, that's wonderful. It's probably a good place to leave it. It's been wonderful to chat to you. And I'm really looking forward to both seeing you a bit more on the Zoom calls, hopefully. Um, also, yeah. sort of more private uh, Facebook group where we can really bear our souls if necessary. Um, and also out on, on the big wide web and in, in, in the blood, blood cancer uncensored page where, you know, um, this will be where some people have seen this video, no doubt. And uh, uh, and if they haven't, then, you know, they'll obviously, you know, uh, be able to find other writings of you. And we will obviously put links to the book there as well um and um yeah well, thank you for letting that book be made available at such a cheap price um it's obvious that your main goal is not here to line your pockets but to actually you know bless other people and help them in some way so we appreciate that here and we thank you for all that you're you're going to do i'm sure um in being a blessing in our community so hope thank you thank you well thank you very much thank you for staying up late and um be well take care and, and we'll be seeing each other soon yeah, I'm sure we'll. Okay. All the best. All the best.